Okay, well, welcome. Uh, I am Laurel Sterling. Some of you, how many of you remember? I know two, three, four, right? Um, that remember? No. I'll let you know. And my assistant, Lily. <laughs> um, so, yes, I was a dietitian here for many years and uh, lectured in the community, and then I had the privilege to join in with Carlson Laboratories. How many of you are familiar with the Carlson? typically the fish oils and the vitamin D. Yep. So I'm their national, one of their national educators, so I travel all over the country to different um, shows. I just came back from a medical conference in California, and I'm going to New York tomorrow, to another one. And so um, we, we are there as well as I go into stores. And thankfully to you guys, I'm, I'm local, so I can come in and, and do lectures, and I'll be at the health fair, too, this year as well as the Carlson do. So, um, today what we're going to do, I know there's been a lot about heart health and, and a lot of this stuff isn't so, so new, um, but I wanted to make it a little bit fun by incorporating some of the products that we have, and, and a lot of people don't think about putting your fish oil on your foods or in your foods. Obviously, it can't be cooked with or heated. Um, we actually are just launching in a couple of weeks out at Expo West some uh, fish oil omega foods mixed in with olive oil and some different seasonings. So they worked with some chefs in, in putting those together. So, but what we've we've done is there's a, a group of um, chefs and sommeliers that are are constantly giving our products taste awards uh, for for great taste. So they then came up with recipes. And I thought, well, this is great because, uh, well, my daughter has been taking fish oil since she was about a year old. And it's easy to give it to her now just to hand her the bottle and say, take it without having to put it into something because she's been taking it since she's one. But when I had clients wanting to give it to their kids and then they were thinking, oh, no, and they hear fish oil and, and the, the consistency in their mouth that they're not used to. I didn't grow up with the dipping bread in the oil or anything like that, so the oil consistency is just bizarre to them. So there's all different things that you can do with it, as you see on these recipes, and we're just going to do a couple of small ones. I'm going to do the, um, the salsa and the guacamole one and um, one of the smoothies, so we'll be able to taste some of that. And just, it's, again, it's easy to get in, to put on, to put over things, and as you saw in the recipe, guys, salad dressings. Um, and with even kids, you can drizzle it over peanut butter and jelly or put it into their yogurt or a smoothie for them, and they don't even know it's in there. So, All right, so, and again, how I run this is you ask questions throughout. You don't need to hold for the end. Um, I was going to wait and do the food at the end. I don't know. I, I thought maybe breaking up, but I think towards the end is when I'm going to just, just finish it off for everybody because it might be too much to break it up. So. Um, heart disease. What is heart disease? It's a general term, obviously covering a lot of different diseases, including um, cerebral vascular diseases, peripheral vascular diseases, and it's still considered number one killer in the United States. So nearly 2,400 Americans die of cardiovascular disease on, uh, each day on average, one death every 37 seconds. It claims about as many lives as combined cancer, chronic lower respiratory diseases, accidents, and diabetes, and the, the complications, obviously, of the that, that causes. So what causes heart disease? There's so many different things. Um, many lifestyle factors, but atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of uh, the blood vessels, arteries, it's the fatty deposits of cholesterol, and, and then it doesn't make them elastic enough, so the blood pressure then gets higher, or you have more occlusions on that blood vessel wall, so there's more of a, you know, occurrences of, of strokes and whatnot. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, we obviously know that's been around for a long time, we've known about. Um, and a lot of times people don't think about these right here, but subpar levels of omega-3s, which I'll be giving you a lot of slides on um, studies with vitamin D and omega-3s, B, vitamin E, and CoQ10. 
So lifestyle factors that kill. Tobacco, obviously, we've known about. High blood pressure, obesity, and again, the complications of obesity. Physical inactivity, high blood glucose, high LDL cholesterol, high salt intake, and with that, there's actually low omega-3. Now, the medical conference that I just came back from was was fascinating. It was all about the, the microbiome, which I'm sure you've heard of that term, which is your gut flora, and the connection with that, with everything, pretty much. But it was also focused on um, brain health as well as cardiovascular disease, and the connections with the microbiome and the brain, and the connections with the microbiome and the heart. Uh, so, um, a lot of it was more than, I mean, even any of the tests that I've ever seen, they were saying different things that needed to be tested outside of just HDL and LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. It's looking at particle size now and it's looking at APOE1 and just APOE4 and all these different things that I don't know if, if here they test for, um, but that something that is on the horizon that doctors now are trying to get more into mainstream, hopefully, to look at. Because you could have higher cholesterol, and I remember it was one of the, I think it was one of the, um, the documentaries that I aired, and the doctor out in California said, well, even if your cholesterol is off, I'm not going to automatically put you on uh, a statin. What I'm going to do is check your carotid, and, and if they're okay, open, flowing, no occlusions, then you're just going to be living your life appropriately and hopefully eating well and exercising. She did. She looked at that beyond just looking at these numbers. So now that that's what they're saying. You need to look at like everything on top of these numbers. So this is a, a nice little. Um, picture showing how everything is layered and leading from one thing into the other. So we know lifestyle risk factors, poor dietary habits, the physical inactivity and the smoking um, are causing metabolic dysfunction, endothelial, which is the layers of the inside of uh, the blood vessels. And if they become leaky and porous, then cellular debris um, starts transferring back and forth outside of the lumen where it shouldn't and causing more inflammation in the body. And that's one of the big buzzwords now. I'm sure you've heard of inflammation, right? Linking all sorts of diseases like cancer and diabetes. So from there, again, obviously leading up to coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke, cognitive decline. So they're all, all interrelated. And then hopefully preventing the death. Um, so these are things that we can modify. So we know we can modify the inactivity, cholesterol levels, diabetes, hypertension, smoking. These are some of the other factors, homocysteine, C-reactive protein. Um, these are more lab values that should be looked at beyond just the LDL and the HDL. They should look at fibrinogen, which is the, the stickiness, the clotting factor. Um, the C-reactive protein, again, inflammatory marker, inflammatory marker. Low omega-3 index. Has anybody heard of the omega-3 index? No? I will be talking about that. It's something that was newer to me that I had never heard about until learning um, from this company what, what this is all about because, again, we're focused on a lot of you know, heart health and brain health um, prevention. So low serum D levels as well as, again, so, inflammation, arthritis, heart disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, all of them are linked together as inflammatory issues. Um, so, inflammation is a natural reaction. Again, your body has this to protect itself. We get those white blood cells and macrophages, everybody coming in as a result of some sort of a trauma or injury. However, when it's not turned off, and I've talked to some of you, you've probably pointed my um, autoimmune lectures, that's when it's not turning off. Uh, the immune system goes on to overdrive and those inflammatory markers continue on a high. And that's when the body starts breaking down in different areas because it's, it's like, what is, what's happening here? We need to calm this inflammation down. We're okay now, but it doesn't. And 
So we need to look at that because inflammation, the underlying issue, a lot of it is um, uh, driven by things like this. So free radicals coming from the environment, things that we eat, stress. Stress actually causes inflammation. Stress throws off the flora in the gut, and then it throws off the, the flora and, and the rest of the body. So everything is intertwined. So when doctors just say, you know, we're going to look at this factor or this factor or this factor, I don't know if you've seen that cartoon where there's the, the elephant and there's all different doctors like, uh, looking at different parts, like a proctologist down here saying, oh, yes, kale, and, um, and uh, looking at the nose and, looking and saying that this is this, but it's actually a whole animal, right? We're not just piecing ourselves off. And that's what I found when I was counseling that a lot of times people said, well, my cardiologist said this, and then my um, primary care doctor said this, and my rheumatologist uh, said this. And so they weren't connecting. They weren't talking to each other, and they were on different meds that might have been conflicting. So we need to look at everything in a whole that's affecting inflammation. So not that you have to understand this, but this is basically the pro-inflammatory cascade. Now, there are good omega-6s, okay, because flaxseed will have omega-6s, hemp will have omega-6s, a lot of the seeds and whatnot do, and they're beneficial ones, but then there are ones that are not beneficial, leading to higher prostaglandins and leukotrienes, so that's basically inflammation driven, okay? And we want to downregulate that. So anti-inflammatory cascade, this is... Typically, again, your omega-3s, uh, again, you got omega-3s coming from flax, hemp, fish, chia, and they down-regulate. They block PGE2, which was, as we mentioned in the last one, this is prostaglandin E2, so it blocks the inflammatory. Um, and this is the downflow into DHA as well from EPA. So if you're taking EPA, it will convert into DHA. But not always the case with flax oils and whatnot, because there is a small percentage of the population that can't convert the um, alpha linoleic acid into the EPA, which then flows into the DHA. So that's why if someone's strictly doing flax, then that's not always going to be giving you what you need for the EPA and DHA. But the fish oil gives it directly to the you. So, um, so. What can omega-3s do? Um, they help maintain a stable heart, healthy blood vessels and circulation, arterial wall elasticity. Again, we want to keep blood pressure down by having the, the walls be very elastic and forgiving. Healthy triglycerides and much more. Brain health as well. So, omega-3 can be found in a wide variety of different foods, and it's great to get them from the foods. Not everybody gets them from the food every day. So that's why we need to look at adding them into our diet. Now, this is the omega-3 index that I was talking about. So this is where they took people, and they looked at um, their, their omega-3 index. And your omega-3s, the eating the DHA, are um, in your blood cell, red blood cell membrane. And they're given as a percentage of how much is in there is how they rated it here on the bottom. So this right here, and this is over four months taking omega-3, okay? So this right here basically is the general population in the USA that is not taking any omega-3s in, and they are not um, eating fish in their diet, really, maybe sporadically or very rarely. So. This is, this is the omega-3 in the as risk for sudden cardiac death. So they were finding that if you weren't taking any omega-3s and didn't really have any fish in your diet, your risk was close to 100% for sudden cardiac death. So if you just had two fish meals a week or took 500 milligrams of a combination of an EPA, DHA, it cut that risk in half. That's the blue line. And then if you took about 700 milligrams, that brought you up to 6%. That's 6% of the EPA, DHA, fatty acids in the red blood cell membrane, okay? 
okay? That's what we're striving for. They found they wanted 8% was the goal. So when people took one gram of the fish oil in combination, again, of EPA, DHA, they had only 10% of the risk of sudden cardiac death. So this, again, was over four months. Yes. Well, typically, yeah, they'll come, like the very finest fish oils that we have or some of the others, we have about, they're about 1,300. Um, they're like 11 to 1,300, usually per teaspoon of the combination of the EPA and DHA. But that's the total omega-3 value. Yep. So, and again, this is seeing that we need to be doing this long term. The, the, that's what the studies are showing, that you need to be on this and you need to be consistent daily um, to keep those blood values where we want at that 8% goal of the fatty acids in the blood cell membrane. So this was an important study, um, the GZ trial. They looked at 11,000 patients with at least one previous heart attack. And they were receiving 900 milligrams of omega-3, and it led to clinically significant reduction in overall cardiovascular. 45% risk reduction for sudden cardiac death was observed after the 3.5 year study, and no change was observed in the placebo. So that means they were getting who knows what in that placebo. Again, another reason why possibly not to do those studies unless you know. <laughs> um, so um, this is again another important reason why you want to make sure that you're getting in enough of your omega. Now this is uh, relating into, remember, with, with some of the risk factors for cardiac health issues. We were talking about um, uh, blood sugar levels, diabetes, insulin resistance. So this is relating the omega-3s to improving insulin sensitivity in older adults. So people with higher omega-3 consumption increase the insulin sensitivity. Because what happens is, is when we have so much sugar running around through our bloodstream, and it wants to put it with the insulin, wants to put it into the cells, and the cells are just overloaded and filled, or the receptors on those cells get so dulled down that they don't listen anymore to, oh, we can't, we can't even hear, what are you talking about? We can't pull you into the cells. We don't know what you're trying to tell us. So that's where this omega-3 helps improve those receptors on the cell membrane to be able to pull in the excess glucose. Um, also important was, remember we talked inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. Ser oops, serum C-reactive protein, inflammatory marker, was significantly reduced, and its trend towards lower interleukin-6, again, inflammation-related, um, was noted as well. So we really want to make sure that we're getting enough of those, as we said, in the diet. Um, so diet and insulin resistance, we know all about, yes. Well, they can, I just don't know how much. I was always told, like, the products that we use are the wild-caught ones. Yeah, because of the, good point, because the farm-raised ones, I've learned that they are fed a lot of grains and stuff that will make them inflammatory, which is what's the issue with um, the beef that is not free-range and the chickens and the eggs that are not free-range, because they give them so many soy, uh, Corn, um, wheat, uh, what else? Soy corn, wheat, GMOs. Yeah, so they're very inflammatory, and then their muscle, which you're basically eating, is inflammatory, and then you take that in, so it doesn't stop. So it's the whole food chain. So you definitely want to have wild caught, wild caught Alaskan. Ours are wild caught off Norwegian waters. So um, in the and I'll talk about that in a little bit as far as how they process it. Thank you. The, um, the uh, Western diet, again, the SAD diet, standard American diet, typically not eating very much of this stuff, but eating more sugar, low intake of vegetables, and, and fiber and whatnot. And we have, versus other countries, a deficiency of essential fatty acids coming in from fish. I mean, I love salmon, but I, I eat it maybe once a month, but when I'm traveling, that's the primary thing that I have 
with salad. So I get it then, but not on a regular basis. So that's why I take fish oil on a regular basis to cover myself. Also looking at mu other micronutrient deficiencies like calcium, magnesium, chromium, vanadium, zinc. These all work with um, the insulin resistance issue. So interrelation between atherosclerosis and insulin resistance. Again, too much of that sugar floating around in the bloodstream lies down um, on the uh, arteries and blood vessels and, and causing more crusting and thickening inside the, the lumen. So um, insulin resistance tied in with hypertension, obesity, hyperinsulinemia, diabetes, dyslipidemia, small dense LDL, like I said, they're now looking at particle sizes of your cholesterol, not just if it's HDL or LDL, um, inflammation, and uh, more clotting. So these are all linking all together. So a lot of times they're out there, you see in the media, oh, vitamin E is not good anymore, or fish oil is not good. Uh, there was, wasn't it recently, uh, not recently, maybe a few years ago, that they were saying men shouldn't have fish oil anymore. Wasn't that in the news? I'm pretty sure we had a bunch of people flock in, and, and they were saying, well, we really weren't supposed to take this anymore. It wasn't helpful for us. Well, again, you have to look at studies. I had a whole class in college where we looked at studies and who funded the studies and, and how many were in it and was it double blind, placebo control, was it actually um, human studies? So you have to look at it. Was it synthetic? Was it not? How healthy were these people? What was their background? All that kind of stuff. Um, so the rate of positive findings in human trials is, again, and this is just looking at some sources of PubMed, which has a lot of clinical scientific studies, as well as GOAD, which is the Global Organization for EPA and DHA. So they found from 2007 to 2015, again, high ratings right across here, positive findings of uh, omega-3s with clinical trials of benefits for a variety of different issues. So what does the American Heart Association say? Um, so, although the mechanisms responsible for omega-3 fatty acids are still being studied, research has actually shown, and this is what they're agreeing with, it showed a decreased risk of sudden death, which is what we're showing at omega-3 index ratio there, arrhythmias, which is heart fluttering, um, decreased thrombosis, the clotting, decreased triglyceride levels, decreased plaquing, improved arterial health, lowering blood pressure. It's all good stuff, right? Um, so, this is their revised chart as of 2002, and they said patients without documented coronary heart disease should just eat at least, here it is, twice a week, preferably the fatty um, fish, the omega-3 fish, include oil, again, the flaxseed, canola, and soybean, um, those, uh, again, are top GMO crops, so I persuade people from those myself. But um, the flaxseed is great, walnuts are great too. Uh, patients with coronary heart, heart disease consuming one gram, and that's what we were showing on that chart, right? The one gram brings you down to a 10% risk of um, sudden cardiac death. And patients needing to lower triglyceride levels, they were finding at least two to four grams of EPA and DHA. And this is GOAD, remember the global organization of EP and DHA that I just mentioned. Theirs are correlating right along with that as well. So, um, pregnancy this and lactation, that's actually gone up to at least a minimum of around six to 700 now. Um, so, this is the triglyceride recommendation. So, if you know your numbers, um, they say typically 150 to 199, take 500 to 1,000. People with 200 to 500 levels of triglycerides take 1,000 to 2,000, and people with severely elevated levels, 500 plus, take more than 2,000. A lot of people are coming and take the two to four grams typically. Now, um, remember that about the triglycerides because there's a small percentage of, of population that um, 
The, the two scripts that I know of fish oils, one is called Vesipa and one is called Lovaza. And the Lovaza is a combination of EPA and DHA. And the Um, but we have it, uh, I think they're starting to put on all the products, but they do have it as a, a little letters, like whether it's TG for triglyceride form or EG for ethyl ester or RTG for uh, re-esterified triglycerides. So basically, triglycerides, I mean, there are some companies saying triglycerides only are the only thing that you should have. You shouldn't have anything other than the natural triglyceride form. That's what it comes from, right, from the fish. And so triglycerides can only give you, the natural form, can only give you 300 milligrams or less of your total omega-3 per 1,000 milligrams. So remember what I said about we need to get at least upwards to 500, 700, 1,000. So you can't get that unless you're putting a ton of the crude oil in there. So what they did is they started looking at, and, and docs like these ethyl esters, and that's what those two scripts, the Lovaza and the Vasupa are. They're the scripted ones. So what they did is they found that the scripted ones actually stayed in the bloodstream a little bit longer than the other forms. So typically, if you have blood, blood pressure, cholesterol issues, take it dinner time with some food, obviously some fatty food, and overnight, it will be um, releasing and working throughout the night. Now, typically, from 3 a.m. to 10 a.m. is when most of the cardiovascular events happen, heart attacks, stroke, stuff like that. So when you're, when you're uh, wanting to take that show, you want to have it dinner time, and so it's working overnight during those early hours because our cortisol levels are, are spiking back up because we're waking and so epinephrine and all that, that's why things start spiking then. So that's the correlation possibly with, with why 3 to 10 a.m. is the, the, the witching hours. So when you look at the ethyl esters, what they do is there, there are three fatty acids. They could be EPA, EPA, DHA, or EPA, DHA, DHA, whichever. But they're connected with a backbone, a glycerol backbone. So that's the natural triglyceride form. So if you want to manipulate it and make it higher EPA or higher DHA, you have to break that off and you have to manipulate these. Now make it like all EPA or higher DHA, whichever way you want it. And then you cap it off because they're very um, unstable unless you do that. You cap it off with ethanol and that becomes those ethyl esters. Okay, again, that's we have formulas that are natural triglycerides as well as ethyl esters because the company started with um, the, like how this company started with the father being a pharmacist, which was a woman as a pharmacist back in 1965. His dad had bad heart angina, and they couldn't figure out what it was. 
And so her mom found this book in a health food store, and it was all about your health and vitamin E. So it was written by Dr. Shu up in Canada. So they went to this institute, and he gave them natural vitamin E, and within three weeks, his pain went away, and he was bouncing around and back to work. But then when he ran out and got more vitamin E, all of a sudden his health went back down again, and he was having chest pain. So they called the Shoot Institute and said, what's going on? And lo and behold, found out that he got a what form of vitamin E? Synthetic form versus he was on a natural form. So, um, so when he started taking the natural form again, he was getting you know healthier again. So his daughter, being the pharmacist, said, hey, I think very important, and we need to you know, give this to the general population here in the states. So that's how this company started back in 1965. So it's based off of research. So that's why we want to have some of these ethyl esters because research is showing, and doctors are showing that this is a good one to have. Um, so re-esterified triglycerides. So you've already taken it off that backbone and you've manipulated it. Well, then you put it back onto the natural glycerol backbone. And that's the re-esterified triglycerides. They're higher amounts of an EPA and DHA than you can get from a natural form, but um, they're they're you know put back onto that glycerol backbone. So they're very similar to the natural form. So is one form better than the other? Again, we were talking about the omega-3 index. Um, when 2011 study found they were looking at the Reesterified triglycerides um, and the ethyl esters. And they said, although in the short term um, the reesterified triglycerides were slightly better absorbed than ethyl esters, um, an appropriate do dose, so an appropriate dose, high enough amount of either form will result in a clinically significant increase in red blood cell concentration of EPA and DHA. Right? That's the red blood cell membrane we were talking about, that so we want to get up to 8%. And they said they were above that 8%. They actually came out with 12% and 13%. So much higher than what they were even choosing for. As long as you take it for long enough time and an appropriate dose, so at least that gram. Um, and uh, this was done, I think, yeah, over six months here. So, and they did um, 1,000 of EPA and Seven, roughly 700 of DHA. So, so why are they important? Again, we've already talked about cardiovascular um, health. Again, I know this is mostly about that, but it also helps out with brain and nerve health. Um, vision, DHA. Most of the retina has um, DHA. The immune system. 80% or more of our immune system is in our gut. EPA and DHA help support the healthy immune responses, as we talked about, and inflammation, joint health, again, relating back to inflammation. So, as I was talking about as far as our standards that we use, um, I knew there was uh, high quality testing that they did, but I just didn't understand until working for the company how much uh, of the testings that we do. So, basically, one of the differences of ours over others is when we have a medically licensed facility over in Norway, okay? And the fish are captured and processed and bottled all right there. They are not captured and then shipped over in big drums, which will cause oxidation issues and all sorts of other problems with the um, oils as far as acidity and whatnot. So it's bottled right over there. And when if you see in the tops of the bottles, it looks like there's a little bit of an air there, but it's not. It's a, it's a nitrogen flush that they put in there to keep it more stable and prevent the oxidation as well. And they also put a little vitamin E in there. Once you open it, you're exposing it to the air, light, heat. So that will help protect the fish oil further when it's in the bottle. And now once you open it, you definitely want to keep it in the fridge and optimally use it within because it, it'll still be okay, but it starts to get, at that point, maybe a little bit of the fishier smell, which it doesn't have normally. So they test over there 30 times before it's bottled. Uh, they're looking at potency, harmful levels of mercury, cadmium, other contaminants. 
Now, in addition to those 30 times after it's bottled, we do three more tests that we pay for that are third-party testing. So again, we have them come in and they test it to make sure that everything's on the up and up. Eurofins over in Europe, IFAS, International Fish Oil um, Society, and the um, American Oil Chemist Society, which is uh, in Canada, no, they're in the States, but IFAS is in Canada, Eurofins is over in Europe. And this is what's on our label. So we have this where it tells you, tested by independent um, FDA labs for three of all these different contaminants. And IFAS, again, International Fish Oil Standards, looks at purity, safety, cleanliness, concentration, and stability. Um, they are testing a whole host of different things. PCBs, dioxins, heavy metals, cadmium, stability. This is new. I remember I was going around asking the company, how can you tell us that there's no radiation in this stuff? And no one could give me an answer. No one. And then when I saw this, I went, oh my gosh, actually somebody's actually testing this stuff. So now they test for radiation levels. And you can go to this website and look to see whatever fish oil or whatever company you're interested in, if, if they're on here. We have never gotten less than the five-star rating. Um, again, it tests for purity and potency and contaminants and whatnot. So um, other companies are on there, but again, we are second to none. We are the leaders in the cod liver oil in, in America, North America. So um, these are, again, very high, high quality tested and tested and tested. This is, again, you don't need to know this whole thing, but this is what we do all this processing because we want to get that potency and pull out further contaminants and further um, tastes and impurities and cloudiness and that kind of thing. And then we add in the natural lemon flavor and the natural vitamin E. Mix it, test it, nitrogen flush it, and then it's all bottled. And then the bottling is then shipped over here. So this is what we're going to be doing a little bit later. I thought maybe I'd take a break and do it now, but I think it's going to push up too much. So um, basically, there are chefs and sommeliers right here over in Brussels, and they test all different types of culinary oils and different oils. And we have constantly been getting the Superior Taste Award. Has anybody tasted the fish oil? No? Yeah. So, um, and people are surprised when they just take it right off the spoon that it doesn't taste fishy. It's just got that natural lemon or the natural um, orange flavor. And that's why they came out with these recipes. They thought, oh, wouldn't it be great when we were working along with some chefs and try to develop some recipes? So that's what they did, and that's what we're going to be doing today, testing a little bit of that. So quality, superior taste award, and then our price per dose. Those are some of our biggest things for fish oils that we, we strive to achieve. Um, you get 1,300 milligrams of your omega-3s, what we want for that omega-3 index, right? We want 13, a lot, well, we said 1,000, but. Um, and it's 62 cents a day. 62 cents a day. Very cheap to get. And then the cod liver oil, you get around the 900, plus you get the extra A and B in there for the immune system um, at 66 cents a day. So not very costly. Now, this is, again, the pill as well as the fluid, uh, the liquid. So remember the omega-3 index that we were talking about here? This one was 500 milligrams, 700, 1,000. So here's 500, 21 cents a day, 730 cents a day, 1,000, 62 cents a day. Whether you want to take it with the capsules, or, and these are all in one dose. This is not like you take five of them to get that amount. It's one capsule or one piece. So we try to make it very economical for everyone as well. Good quality, good tasting, economical. Now, remember I talked about the um, Vestipa, the scripted? Usually those scripts cost anywhere from two to $400 a month, depending on your insurance. So this one 
very cost effective. Now, if you're taking two a day, that's going to last a while. If you're taking four a day, again, that would be in this 120 soft gel a month's worth. But again, a lot less um, for uh, that you can get over the counter versus a scripted one. And this is just giving you the same as that that is. I don't know if Nature Time. I didn't get a chance to check if they carry this EPA one now. It's a newer one. We also now have a high. DHA one and another um, combination one. And one of the ones I'm using today, um, I'm using the cod liver oil lemon flavor, but the two recipes called for the Med Omega, which is our highest concentration of the liquid for the omega 3s. It's a lemon lime. Obviously, it was used for the recipe with the avocado, um, the, uh, guacamole, and uh, the other recipe. So, why the difference, or what is the difference between cod liver and fish oil? Why would you want to take one over the other? Well, again, uh, the cod has the vitamin A and D, which gives you a little bit extra leg up for the immune system this time of year. You know, even when I was out, I was out in California when I thought, what? Wow, and it was at the height of when it was mudslides. I was driving around mudslides and flooding and rain. And, you know, so they don't get this, like, high, high sun out there, too. You know, when I talk about the vitamin D, you'll see they actually did studies where they looked at people in um, San Diego and Phoenix and Miami in summertime, and their D levels were very low, very low. So even out there, here especially, you're going to need extra A and D for the immune system. Um, this one actually has more of a one-to-one -one ratio, closer to one-to-one -one of the EPA and DHA, whereas the fish oil, no A and D in there typically, and it's more EPA than the DHA. Which, as we saw in that slide, EPA flows down into making DHA, so you're still getting um, DHA in there. So before I go into D, any questions? For for her, well, it, again, it depends on um, it depends on what your what issues you're dealing with. Are you saying between these two or for heart health or for anything in general? In general, yeah. So if you're already taking a multi that has some A and D in there, and typically we take extra D this time of year. I mean, I take around five, six when I'm flying. I take sometimes like ten thousand because I'm trying to ward off anything. Um, amongst my seeds. I also spray that on my hands <laughs> and put it on my nose because I, I'm just on airplanes all the time. So um, at least one gram of, you know, your fish oil, whether it's coming from a capsule or a liquid, you want one gram of the omega-3. Now, the, whether you want to have the cod this time of year, for the fish oil, again, cod, you're not going to have as much of the uh, omega-3s in there, but you still get a significant amount. I think that one has, um, I thought it was like 1,100. Yeah, it does have 1,100 of the omega-3. So you're still getting the amount that you need for that um, omega-3 index on the cod. So some people don't want to get too much A because they worry about that. Some people don't take them all day. So they'll get their A that way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So krill oil. Krill oil was touting sustainability, which that's so-so now. But also they were touting the fact that they have natural phospholipids that get incorporated into the cell membrane more efficiently and work more efficiently. But they haven't really been seeing that too much in the studies. and. The amount of krill oil and the cost of it is so much higher whereas versus this. So, you know, I was thinking that way back, too, because of what we were hearing and what we were learning. And then, since then, it's flipped from all the research that I've seen and that it's basically going towards the fish oil. Did you have a question? Oh, it was the same thing? Okay. Anything else on this? More mercury in that? Really? Yeah, I don't know. 
I mean, again, you see how we've tested it. And you can go online and you can, if, if there is a company that you use, you can go on to the IFOP and check and see if they actually get any of that extra testing. Yep, and it would have the analysis of all that. Oh, right, and they're a great company, yeah. So I would think that they would, I would think that that would be beneficial, too. Again, they all have different things in them of reasons why, why someone would want cod over the fish oil. Again, one of these reasons, because this one has extra A and D. Um, so that that's not bad. Again, one of the big things is a deterrent is the cost, too, because typically the, the krill is pretty, pretty expensive for the amount. Um, so vitamin D, not just our sunshine vitamin. I mean, actually, it's not really a vitamin because it's something that we can make in our body from the sunlight. So um, it, some of the things it does, regulates calcium, phosphorus, absorption of bone and muscle strength, um, impacts your red blood cell health, helps regulate cell growth, immune system modulator, um, helps out with the parathyroid, chemoprotective, and associated with reduced rates of cancers. Again, this is all things that you can see on the vitamin D culture website and research on PubMed. Um, so vitamin D, many names, again, another thing that can be kind of confusing, possibly. Colocalciferol, the D3, the natural human form that's made in the skin. And this right here will show a little bit more of what this is saying. So colocalciferol converts to calcidiol in the liver, and calcidiol circulates throughout the body and the blood. It also is called 25-OHD, and this is the form that's actually tested. Like if I'm using a blood test, it'll say 25-OHD. That's the one that's floating around in the bloodstream. And calcidiol, and it's very short-living, um, whereas the hormone is not. So calcidiol converts to the hormone calcitriol in the kidneys, and calcitriol is also formed by immune cells as well as other cells in the body. So as I said, the sun has to hit the skin. Then there's this factor in the skin called 7-D-hydrocholesterol that converts this into colocalciferol, your vitamin D. In the liver, 25-hydroxylase acts upon the colocalciferol to convert it into calcidiol, which again, as I said, in the bloodstream, short acting, and that's what's tested. And then you go into the kidneys, and the 1 alpha hydroxylase converts it into calcitriol, the hormone form, or other tissues um, make it as well. Now, interesting how there are receptors found everywhere in the body, right? In the we usually just think of it as bone health, right? Bone health. Or possibly now within the immune system. But now, again, you're seeing throughout everywhere. So we know osteoblast, again, that's the bone, but parathyroid, the B cells and the T cells, that's your immune system. Those are your sheep to kill, or the, we're going to show around, that's the sheep to kill, that's the T and the B cells. The neurons in the brain, the colon, the prostate, the breast, stomach, pituitary, Placenta, liver cells, ovarian, endocrine, skin, everywhere. Everywhere. So we've well undershot the importance of vitamin D over the years. Hopefully now we know it's up again mainstream. There are dietary sources, but not a lot of us eat this all the time. Fish liver oils, again, you're going to get some from your cod liver oil. About in a teaspoon, you'll get around 400 IU. And by the way, just to confuse all of us a little bit more, when I was telling people, no, A is in IU, and D is in IU, which is international units, they're now going to change all the labeling by 2018 to saying micrograms and milligrams. So now you're going to be seeing your fat-soluble vi vitamins A, D, E, um, in micrograms and milligrams, which is apparently I found out the rest of the world has already converted that, but we haven't. So now we're trying to get up to the speed of the rest of the world with the labeling of that. But what we are doing, I don't know if other companies are doing that, we're putting in parentheses what would be equivalent. Like, I saw something come, we get samples all the time, 
and it was a calcium and vitamin D, and it came and said 10 mi milligrams, I think. And then I was like, wow, that's 10. That is so low. And then I looked in the parentheses that said equivalent is 400 IU. So I thought, oh. So hopefully they're going to be doing that so we can understand what, what it's going to be. Oops, meaning. Um, so also eggs, um, typically from vitamin D supplemented hens or fortified milk. Usually this is like equivalent to four glasses a day, which not a lot of people are doing because we're backing away from milk, dairy products nowadays. So, as I was saying, you know, the in the height of the summer is when they were looking at those people in, in Miami and San, and San Diego. So what are some of the things that are prohibited? Um, it's dependent on season and time of day. Usually they say that 10 to 2 time of day, um, season. So from anywhere from October, I usually say September through to April typically, you're not going to be getting, the sun is not going to be hitting at the right angle, you're not going to be able to convert and make it enough. Also, in those places where they were had low vitamin D, they probably were putting a lot of what? Sunscreen. Now look at, 95% of D was blocked by SPF of 8, and 99% was blocked with SPF of 15. Look usually below 15. <laughs> we're looking at like 30 or above. So we're blocking, as well as um, darkly pigments in skin reduced up to 99 percent. And then as we age, person at age 70 is making um, 20 percent of what they made at age 20. So it's age, it's skin color, it's clothes we have on, it's SPF that we. It's where we live. It's the time of day. It's the time of the year. All that kind of stuff. So it's prohibitive for us to make enough vitamin D. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I don't, you know, I, I have my own chickens, and I looked at that, and I thought, how did they know? Because I, what am I going to do, drop vitamin D on my, you know, chicken's food? Or is it in the feed, maybe? I mean, my, my, I get organic feed, and I've never really looked at the label to see if there's vitamin D. There may be. I'm going to actually start doing that. I'm going to go home and look at the feed bag and see if it's in there. So, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. So that's, yeah, so take your D, exactly. Um, so the test is easy and inexpensive. Um, again, as I said, it's 25 OHD. The normal range they're saying is 30 to 100. Um, the goal is not less than 30. The proposed ideal is 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. And again, Medicare can approve testing if you have muscle pain issues. Um, that's one of the symptoms if you have muscle fatigue or um, tingling muscles. I had one girl come in and she didn't know what it was. They thought she had MS all these tests and found out she had severely low D. It was like 8 or something like that. And once she started getting her levels up, then she felt better. But it takes a few months to actually get your levels up. So this is, again, wide variances of what's suggested. Now, the Food and Nutrition Board, which is well, the one that sets the standards, unfortunately, look how low all this is. They say, well, sufficiency is, you know, no, no, that's not the case. Um, the endocrine society, doctors and chronologists, uh, are saying typically sufficiency 30 to 100. Vitamin D council, they get, again, are doing tons of research. Docs that are really up on vitamin D importance are usually using the standards of the D council. Um, some docs use the endocrine society. They're, u they're looking at this thing as kind of ridiculous. Um, the ones that are setting the standards. Again, the vitamin D council typically says, from what they've seen in research, 50 is what you want to shoot for for your lab value. So, these are the amounts to get what their recommendations were on this chart here. So, for the vitamin D council, for adults, they're saying to get to that sufficiency of 40 to 80, you need to be taking around 5,000 a day. 
endocrine society, they're saying to get to that 30 or so, you need to be taking 1,500 to 2,000. You know, I usually tell people to take at least that amount. Um, and the Food and Nutrition Board are saying to get to that 20, take about 600 to 300. And they're recommending that to more than that to pregnant women now. Um, so we know that that's well under what uh, we should be shooting for. So this time of year, if people are confused, I usually say to get your test. This is a perfect time right now to get your blood level tested to see what you're, where you're at. Um, the other time I usually say is around September when you're coming right out of the height of summer when you think, oh, my levels are really high. They may not they may already be in the toilet. <laughs> so you want to see where your levels are there to be able to gauge how much you need to take. So vitamin D, again, linking with inflammation. So this is linking in with heart health. So D deficiency has been correlated with circulatory markers of infl inflammation in adult subjects. D is able to downregulate the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly NF um, alpha and interleukin six and TRP, which is reactive protein. Off all inflammatory markers. Okay. So, and typically C-reactive protein is high in acute stages of inflammation after someone's had a heart attack. Usually, CRP is very high. Um, so, if they see CRP being high, then that's uh, a an alarm going off in the physician's head saying, okay, why is this so high? What happened? Did you just have rheumatic fever? <laughs> or, did you, you know, what's happening? Why is that so high? It should not be that high. So we have a wide variety of vitamin Ds out there. Again, you can get it from your Super D Omega-3, which gives you 2,000 D with your Omega-3 combined in there, the cod liver oil. Solar D-Gems, that comes in a capsule, so that's 2,000 of D3 plus your omega-3. You have the little drops, and this is what I use, and I use that for my daughter. Um, we used to not have the gravity fed. Has anybody used the drops at all? The drops? Yeah, you had to sit there and wait for it to actually feed down into the little... Yeah, some people, some people do that. Some people put it on their hand and then they lick it off their hand. I just I just feel it dropping onto my tongue. It takes a little while and you have to be a little patient. But um, you should take these um, with some fattier foods, again because it's a fat soluble vitamin. Uh, so so whether you want to take the capsules, this is per one capsule or per drop or per teaspoon. We have a wide variety of ones. Right. Meaning the, the the other the other ingredients or of of our line or just right. Well, it might be the ca well you, when you deal with capsules, it's going to be different because then you've got soft gels and things flow factor. Oh yeah, well with some some people do use like a safflower or other or there might be a an E or something. Right, right. So I just know I don't know the other companies. I've always even before I worked for them, I've always used their fish oil and their meat or whatever. Um, so I I like. Yeah, yeah. So again, and with our testing procedures, I think we're, um, I can't comment on the others because I don't, I don't look at them in a long time. <laughs> I don't know what else is in them. But when you're looking at capsules versus liquids of anything, they're going to have so much more in capsules to try to keep things preserved. And 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 a lot of times you can't use um, you have to use soft gels versus veggie caps because things disintegrate, and so they use a variety of different. Uh, in there. So that's why I like the liquids better. Okay, so vitamin D with heart disease. Low levels of vitamin D increase risk of myocardial infarction. So men with a vitamin D deficiency, less than 15 is their vitamin D level, had twice the risk. So halving the vitamin D, which the amount should be at least 30, if you half it to 15, 
the risk of heart attack in men doubles. Okay? So there's so much evidence out there with vitamin D um, linking, again, there was a Framingham heart study, patients with D levels, same kind of thing. The same, I think that's actually the same. No, it's but stating the same kind of thing there. There's also the link with vitamin D and HDL particle size. Remember I was talking about not just looking at LDL and where's your HDL and where's your cholesterol, total cholesterol. They're looking way beyond even this particle size. Okay, so when you're looking at what's happening here, is it the, the darker color? It's including more and more. So they're looking at the carotid intima media thickness. So here they were looking at Rush University found higher D levels may be associated with higher large HDL, which is beneficial cholesterol, particles. Theoretically, vitamin D may protect against cardiovascular risk by promoting formation of the large HDL particles affecting reverse cholesterol because HDL will pull the LDL out of the body. Yes. It is. No, no. That's again a bunch of uh, sugary plaques LDLs, like LDL is good cholesterol, and we need it for for many things. Um, that uh, we need LDL for uh, a lot of things in the body, but when it's oxidized, is then when the issue is because the body looks at it and says, "Ah, uh, you right." It's saying. Higher, finds higher serum D levels may be associated with higher large HDL. That's a good thing. That first sentence is good. You want, you want higher amounts of large HDL. So that's supporting what you're saying. Because when they have smaller particles of LDL, the net gets stickier, it oxidizes, the macrophages come in and try to gulf it, and then it sticks and causes more of that occlusion up there. So HDL, more of that is going to be pulling the LDL away. So that's a good, that's a good thing. So that's linking the D in with. Right. All right there. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, vitamin D and stroke. A uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study involving 58 patients with a history of stroke and baseline vitamin D levels less than 30. This is Canadian, 30. Um, supplementation with vitamin D may improve endothelial function, again, inside of the blood vessels, uh, the elasticity. Patients had 100,000 units of oral vitamin D2, D2, which has to be converted. That's typically what you get from Physicians is a D2 to 50,000 once a week, or a placebo for 16 weeks. At week eight, the flow mediation dilation, so the, the flow, the dilating of the blood vessels, higher in the D group at eight weeks compared with the placebo. And higher dose of oral vitamin D through short term improvement in the endothelial function. That was D2. You're not getting that. We're getting the D3. I'm not going to read all this, but this is basically saying, again, D helps out with these inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, and fibrinogen, um, having enough D. No, just meaning like there was a placebo group, and then there was, they, they didn't know who was getting what. They just said, okay, here's a placebo group, but you're getting this, and then here's a group of Yeah, yeah, the doctors. And you Which is why we have now 10,000 in the cap. Yeah, we have the highest we have is a ten thousand in one. So you can do that five days a week and you get that fifty thousand. 
and it's better in the absorption because it's already in that most bioavailable form to the body. So you and both of you weren't getting results with the B2. Yeah, I took 2,000 to bring mine up over, sporadically over a few months. It went from 34 up to 56 or something like that, within two months, just over 2,000. And then they were finding, too, that some people's levels weren't going up without having it with food. So that's another thing, is having it with food, too. But you, you, I had, in all the years that I practiced, 16 some odd years, I had one person, and I don't know if Annette, you can chime in on anybody that you counseled, that, that had, that came in already that had had a level above 100. But if, if you even look at, like, this is the vitamin D count right here. Vitamin D council is saying toxicity level is above 150. Everybody's different. You know, I, I, but I've only had one person that came in with a high. Everybody typically, 99.9% .9 came in at well below 30, unless they were on it. And, and I actually worked with someone who has to take 10,000 units a day to maintain. Now she's 60, but she has to take 10,000 a day to just maintain uh, a level of around 45 or 50. And she lives in Florida. This, this is all the time. I, it's just the way she is, and she lives in Florida. Yep, and she doesn't go outside much. Yeah, and it's, it's also, you know, she's, that I don't know. I don't know that. But, you know, now they're pairing D and K together, too, finding that they help each other, um, pulling each other in and whatnot. So, um, just get, the the thing is is to keep on top of getting your levels checked for sure. As far as absorption, it depends on your own. You know, the liquid obviously doesn't have anything as a barrier for absorption. Um, with soft gels, yes, there's going to be that where it's going to have the gel is going to have to be yeah. Yeah. For the fish oil, for people with cardiovascular. Right. No, just with the food. There was one study. So if you have some fat, yeah, with some sort of a fat, fat. Again, fat soluble vitamins, you want to have some sort of fat in with it. If you're having egg or a little bit of yogurt with some fat in it, something like that. Peanut butter, exactly. Almond butter, nuts, or whatever. Something like that. Oops. ones, the little ones under the, yeah, and, and again, that's another form too, sure, yep, they dissolve right under there, and then it's supposed to be absorbed right into the bloodstream,
again, you saw how it was connecting in with the parathyroid and thyroid. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So vitamin D insufficiency, uh, levels below 30 is associated with statin-induced myalgia, so the muscle slowing up. I always thought this was just CoQ10 issues, because it, I talk about that in a little bit. Um, but um, importantly was the myalgia was reversed with continuing vitamin D supplementation, even while continuing don't know in this how much they were using in this study, I see, but um, not just focus on kind of So like okay. I said, vitamin E is another important one. Um, again, that's how this company was founded for heart health. It was on vitamin E, a natural vitamin E. So there's a family of eight compounds. They all work differently. The tocopherols and the tocotrienols. There's alpha, beta, delta, gamma. Now, we want to, we primarily have, you see, alpha tocopherol in a lot of the studies or in the supplements as well because that's primarily what they find in the body. But they find that if you have too much of any of these, gamma is very cancer protective, they found in research. So if you have too high of one of these, it drives the gamma down. So that's why it's good. What was good that came out of that whole vitamin E horror story of the meta-analysis that they looked at and said, don't take vitamin E anymore, which, again, that was completely skewed with synthetics and people that were so ill that they weren't going to have a benefit and the amounts that they used. So um, you want to have a well-balanced, complete vitamin E with um, a mixed tocopherol and tocotrienol. So benefits, it's an antioxidant that, again, from here forward, Um, it's an important antioxidant that protects our tissues, so as we know that the fats are a part of the cell membrane. Um, Fat-soluble vitamin alpha tocopherol is uniquely suited to intercepting free radicals, so as we talked about inflammation, free radicals coming from the environment, foods that we eat, breakdown of foods, those are the, they're called ROSs, reactive oxygenated species. They are things that rust our cells. Um, so, or, you know, make them crustier. Um, so we want to make sure that we have those antioxidants to combat those free radicals. Uh, alpha tocopherol also protects the fats in LDLs from oxidation. Remember I was talking about this? Just that the LDLs are okay as long as they're not oxidized, and this protects that. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but vitamin E um, definitely helps out with heart disease, as they the largest trial to date, vitamin E reduced cardiovascular deaths in women by 49%. So 40,000 women received 300 IUs or a placebo for 10 years. So they found that basically women over age 45 or who received vitamin E experienced 24% reduction in cardiovascular deaths. Vitamin E reduced all major cardiovascular events in those over age 65 by 26% due to a 34% reduction in heart attacks and a 49% reduction in cardiovascular deaths overall. So vitamin E, another study showing it reduced blood clots up to 49%. Um, these are, again, more studies showing that it helps out with um, decreasing the inflammation, the interleukin-6, um, and the C-reactive protein, linking it with the atherosclerosis. More studies looking at um, non-fatal heart attacks and risk reduction using vitamin E 400 to 800 IUs. Um, risk reduction of 77% after 1.4 years. More evidence they're showing again, anti-inflammatory. It just continues. Anti-inflammatory. It's used over and over. Looking at um, vitamin E with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, again, autoimmune. The body's not turning off that inflammation that's going on. It doesn't know what to do. So vitamin E, 800 IUs, lowered CRP in half in four weeks. Typically, I say around 400. Again, you're, if you're using omegas and you're using vitamin E and you're using your D, all those in combination are going to protect your heart. Vitamin E also helps out with hot flashes, too, and it um, helps out with uh, the 
skin tissue in women when, when um, the tissues are thinning and whatnot. So there's another benefit of why women might want to take more of the vitamin E, too. Um, there's a mild estrogenic effect from vitamin E. So again, looking at interleukin-6, which stimulates production of C-reactive protein. You don't want to have a high CRP, so vitamin E is decreasing the inflammatory markers. Now, it's, this is showing here over the years how it is safe and effective. Again, like I said, people were saying, oh, I'm not going to take any more because of what I read. Well, it was associated with, in 1993, a uh, 30 to 40% reduced risk for coronary disease in 9,000 nurses. 1993, another one looking at um, vitamin E intake is inversely related to the risk of colon cancer. Um, 1994, vitamin E levels intake were inversely correlated with coronary deaths in both women and men in a large 5,000 long-term study. More on vitamin E. Um, oh, uh, 2004, looking at vitamins E and C in combination associated with reduced prevalence and incidence of Alzheimer's. That's a big thing now that they're looking at is not just heart disease, they're, lo they're looking at all these dementia and Alzheimer's. Like I said at that conference, the medical conference, that was big. Inflammation, gut microbiome, cardiovascular, and um, you know, brain health. 2007 um, found 49% decrease in deaths from cardiovascular illness. So again, a lot of benefits a reason to take vitamin E, such as helps out with cardiovascular health, helps out supporting blood vessels, reduces the formation of unwanted blood clots, neutralizes those free radicals that oxidize our cells, that rust our cells, supports nerve cell growth, normalizes cellular growth and multiplication and healthy immune system. And this is, I like this one that you done to read because 400 I use and it's got the um, alpha tocopherols and this is I just wanted to put in here because we're talking about um, the antioxidants. CoQ10, ACEs, ACEs is A, C, E, and selenium. Researchers have found, and you've probably heard this, gum disease associated with heart disease. Okay? People that have gum disease are almost twice as likely to suffer from coronary artery disease. So inflammation, again, the root of the cause. You need to have more antioxidants in your diet or taking them to supplementation to stop that rusting our cells. Um, this is our ACEs product that we have here and uh, looking at vitamin E and reducing um, inflammation and helping out with metabolic syndrome, diabetes prevention. CoQ10, an important antioxidant. Antioxidants will defeat the free radicals, again, that are formed that we were talking about. It's concentrated in the heart. Now, they've actually seen that CoQ10 is decreased as we age naturally. It's, it's concentrated in the mitochondria, the ATP production in our cells. And it is also blocked by the statin. So we already are losing it as we age, and then it's being blocked further. And it's a very important antioxidant that we need. increases energy and whatnot. So you you're on a statin or blood pressure um, medication, you at least want to be taking 100 milligrams, at least, of CoQ10. Again, plasma CoQ10 may be a predictor of chronic heart failure and mortality. This is a good product we have. It's a fish oil multi with CoQ10 in there. Again, I'm not sure if they have it. Need to have it. Um, but CoQ10 depletion is associated with worse outcomes in congestive heart failure. They were looking at 100 to 200 milligrams of CoQ10 per day in the month. Yeah, you would I'm not sure on that. I want to say it's 100. I thought it was 100. Right, some are like 30. And that's, again, for someone who maybe just wants to make sure they're getting more of it in. But if you're really on blood pressure or statin, they've seen it blocking this. So you want to make sure that you get at least 100. And I think it says, it's so blurry, but I think it says right there 100 in that. Um, again, more on CoQ10. 
trying to look at our time there. I'm almost done. So cardiovascular clinical research looking at D-ribose, which is a five carbon sugar that is used in the, again, ATP powerhouse energy production. So these are just some studies citing that um, it's D-ribose has been shown to improve heart function through a wide array of clinical work over the last 30 years. That's something, too, that someone may want to look at. Homocysteine, again, inflammatory marker. Homocysteine is considered a primary risk for cardiovascular disease, including the stroke and deep vein thrombosis. So I'm not going to read all that in the study. Um, these are two products that we have because you want to look at vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid typically are lower with higher homocysteine levels. So making sure that you have a good B complex. And these are water soluble. If you have a lot of stress, you're going to be urinating or sweating off those Bs. So a multi will have Bs, and typically you want to take some Bs, again, around noon time or one or so. You don't want to take them later because they may be stimulating and keep you awake. So think of it like caffeine. If you can only take caffeine until noon, Take your bees only till noon, and don't go beyond that. Um, the bee complete is a good one as well. This just this is fading out. The tri bee only has the three in there to help out with the homocysteine. So if you are specifically targeting homocysteine levels, that's the one you want. The bee complete is a combined. Not a normal test, but it will be done if you have. They have merit to do it if there are inflammation issues or heart issues. Or Not a typical one, a standard one on your blood test that I Right, yeah. How do you know what the, if they'll. Yeah, well, if you just wanted to just kind of get a gauge, I think I've asked for it before just to see where my levels were. But they usually don't do it unless they say, oh, you know, you've got. X, Y, and Z issues, or they can't find whatever, why your, um, some autoimmune issues going on, they don't know what it is, they'll look at those levels too. Um, right, true. So, so in that case, then I would say at least make sure you have adequate amounts in your multivitamin, and then if you think there are issues, you can just get the blood or possibly have family issues heart disease, then maybe you just want to get the test taken at least once. So, oh, okay, well, I love you fine. No, no, your B. B. Yeah, the B vitamins that help out keeping the homocysteine. They, uh, they help out with um, converting the homocysteine to, to excrete it out of the body. So if you don't have enough of it, it stays high in the body, and the body's like, oh, inflammation. It's not excreting it out. Did I say Okay. Yep, we're almost done. Do you want to start with um, picking up the cilantro? Uh, so put on gloves to leave. <laughs> um, so magnesium, I did lectures on magnesium and how, how important it is um, in the body. It's used in, um, just uh, leave it on the board right there. So magnesium is a mineral that's used in over 325 enzymatic processes in the body. It relaxes all smooth muscles. It helps with blood pressure um, reduction and maintaining those at normal levels. It's, and again, cardiovascular relaxes that, and that's a muscle. So magnesium is very important to have enough of. Too much of it, we know, can be possibly relaxed because it relaxes your gut wall as well. So you want to make sure you don't get too much of that and find the right amount and, and get a nice chelated one. These are just uh, formulas that we have, and I'm not sure if they have all of them. Um, and ones that I've mentioned, too, there might be some that, that needs has that they don't have, or they can get in if you are interested in any of them. Um, but I know that we used to have here the Rhythm Right and I think Heartbeat Elite. But these are just combination formulas, again, overall cardiovascular conditions that I've been talking about. The um, fish oil multi, terastilbene, actually, it's like a resveratrol. It's just some blueberries, and it's apparently they're liking this because they're finding it stays in the bloodstream much longer, um, and it's just 
stain, so uh, this is another antioxidant cardio protective. Um, inflammation balance, K2, you want to team that up now with blood vessel health as well as your vitamin D, pulling that into the bone appropriately. So those are some others. So that is it. I know, that was a lot. And now we've got to cook for you. <laughs> Actually just kind of um, blend up or uh, use the food processor. So are there any questions on any of these? Yeah. Vitamin E. Well, that has to go to the doctor to, to find out. There are some people, there's, all, there's new um, blood centers out there. That works on a different pathway, then coming in and warfarin that doesn't have the same blood clotting. Is that what it is, Arelco? That doesn't have the same clotting effect. Okay. See, so there's all this. So, so the so the thing is, is they usually do the the protein test to see how thick the blood is or not. And some people can get away with eating K foods, and I had one gentleman who couldn't have a smattering of K in anything because it was clotting and disrupting everything. So basically I'm saying take it back to the doctor first and see because some people actually took other things like they're regularly taking fish oil and they're okay with it as well as being on the medication. It just depends person to person and how your clotting factor is. So you're welcome. Anything else? Um, 